You're listening to the Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast with Terrence Murphy, where we cover sales, investing, and entrepreneurship with an emphasis on real estate. Each podcast, Terrence and his guests will bring you informative and inspiring information within the real estate industry. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Entrepreneur with Terrence Murphy. My guest today is Till Henderson. Till comes from a commercial real estate family office based out of Aspen in Hawaii. She's been a net lease broker since 2006 and has transacted over $1 billion in net lease transactions. Till has been in business for 15 years, which has helped, helped her grow a large database of relationships with numerous owners and buyers. Till joined the b e about two years ago with a boutique national net lease firm that uses cutting-edge technologies to quantify the data in commercial net lease investors and brokers. Since then, she's also started a real estate fund for professional athletes. Welcome her to the show today. 95% of all millionaires become that through owning real estate. More money has been made in real estate than all industrial investments combined. The wise young person or wage earner of today invests their money in the real estate. Andrew Carnegie. This is a very, very old quote, but it's still timely today. So I have a guest. We've been really talking on and offline and I'm excited to bring her on, Ms. Till Henderson. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Terrence. I'm really happy to be here. Tell me your story. I know we're going to dive into it. And before we go, we have to talk about Hawaii but uh, and Aspen too. But uh, tell me your story. I mean, give me your story from A to Z and then kind of lead me to what you're doing today and how you got there. Like, you know, because there's a story. Everybody's got a story. Well, you know, born into real estate. So that was probably always going to be my path. Dad was a general contractor, poured concrete, but he was in Aspen. And so as the housing and the boom kind of started there, he just happened to be in one of the best real estate markets there was to grow and and build. I think he quickly learned um, the difference between residential uh, investments, building and ownership and commercial was how passive the ownership was or how much work you had to put, put into it. And he started to shift his focus to commercial. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, building and holding and collecting rent from his tenants uh, that were, you know, dentists and doctors and bars and restaurants to, you know, really deciding that, hey, this is going to be what our family office focus on, which is going to be the acquisition of passive real estate ownership that provides cash flow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as he went through that process, it got to, hey, there are different classes of tenants. You know, the mom and pop pizza shop down the street is a tenant that could pay rent for, you know, whatever your lease terms are. But then you also have government entities like uh, we had a building that uh, the DEA was had a very long term 50 year lease on. So, you know, being able to learn that from my family that, you know, there's there's so many different ways to get involved in real estate. And this was one that, you know, our family kind of focused on, which was how passive can that ownership be and still cash flow? And then how do you mitigate some of the risk of, of owning those things? And so um, born in Aspen, grew up there for a little while, and then they moved to Hawaii. He decided that <laughs> location, location, location is really going to be the premise of of where he buys and and where he lives and so we moved to hawaii um to the big island actually in kona and i grew up there until we moved to honolulu and i went to high school in honolulu so you know the the assets that they wanted to have were always going to be colorado you know they had a couple in florida Colorado, uh, sorry, I said that, Arizona, Hawaii. So really picking out those markets that you knew were going to be a little bit more resistant to any kind of economic you know, turbulence. Mm -hmm. More luxury. Yeah. So I played college tennis at UNLV. And after college, kind of came back to, you know, to the nest and cut my teeth a little bit on property management. We had a 50-unit apartment building in Tucson that I learned very quickly, even with a property manager, it's really labor intensive. There's a mm -hmm. lot of management going on when you have multifamily. So really being a good operator or partnering with a good operator is important on that. And then I, you know, my husband played college football like you, and then 
really tried his best to get into the NFL. And like so many other players, you know, was bouncing around here or there for a year or two or practice squad and getting cut and, and going on tryouts and stuff. So after a very short career, quickly figured out that an injury is something that you just don't account for. And it happens so much, as you know, with your story. And as soon as that happened, it was kind of crickets, you know, from his management and, and he wasn't prepared for what's next. What's the, what's my second career? You know, he's been playing football since he was, since he was in little league. So Mm -hmm. the transition is, is rough. And he decided to um, start a NFL agency um, to be a contract advisor and wanted to focus on second careers, wanted to focus on creating a budget you know, waiting for that second contract before you buy anything that depreciates, Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing, really being disciplined. And real estate was always something that you could participate in on the off season. You could get your license. You could learn how to purchase your first home, just being able to have that knowledge base to be able to say, is this a good home purchase? You know, if you're going to buy a rental property or have a second home, so that's kind of where our, our lives were kind of focused. You know, he ended up going back to get an MBA just to be competitive in, you know, the business world. And I went on to really focus on net lease commercial real estate. So triple net lease assets are, you know, if you're driving down Main Street in your city, it's the Walgreens, the Starbucks, the Chase Banks, the, you know, Chipotle's, the Bar- Burger Kings. You know, most of your national tenants do not own their properties. And so they're tenants, they rent. And so being a landlord to those tenants is really where I wanted to, you know, focus my energy. So I spent about 15 years doing brokerage. Um, So buying, representing buyers and sellers of these types of assets and um, ended up being with a really great company that taught me a lot. Um, our CEOs actually wrote a book on net lease investing. What's that book, too? That is, I think it's the little uh, book of triple net lease investing. Okay. And it was really written to kind of educate investors on this specific sector of real estate. And it's a great book. And um, I don't know if it's in circulation anymore, but you know, it was one of the ones that really kind of drew me into this is going to be where my focus was instead of just doing land and some other things, leasing. And so, you know, one of my mentors took a friends and family fund that he had a group of close families and friends that were investors in triple net leased assets and took that REIT and made it public. Mm. And so going from a private REIT to a public REIT, it was kind of a, it was a great journey to see how that can happen. And it was also something that sparked some passion into my career as I'm kind of heading into the tail end, which was, you know, how do I give my industry back? How do I thank my industry and and what can I do to make my industry better? Because I love commercial real estate, won't do anything else. And, but what could I do that actually gives back using that, that platform? And what I wanted to do was I wanted to bring the triple net lease investing into professional sports. As you know, it's such a sad statistic uh, about how, especially football players, that don't get that guaranteed money uh, and guaranteed benefits, how difficult it is for them to stay financially stable just years after leaving the field. And, you know, it struck me that part of that was because of the lack of access access and exposure to this particular industry. Um, You know, it's a good old boys club. So my goal was to widen it, to open it up, maybe change the landscape, add some diversity. Uh, to who was really sitting at these tables because it's a great investment. And why aren't these guys, when they have those years of being high net worth, you know, individuals, why aren't they investing into these properties that would allow them to continue their focus on the field because it's so passive in ownership and management. And that was really what kind of 
started this journey uh, that stops three or four years now. So that brings me to where I am now, which is I am managing a fund for professional athletes. Um, actually, all of them except one are current and retired NFL players. And that's kind of my heart, obviously, because of my husband and all of his you know, teammates and colleagues. But I've also got a son who's uh, going to be a sophomore here next year who, you know, football is something that he's really passionate about. So kind of wanted to do something that I would hope somebody would continue doing for the next generation of players. And so what we did is we set up a fund that wasn't just going to take these players' money and invest it and give them a nice return back and send them on their way. I really wanted to educate them. I really wanted to open up this industry to see which ones were acclimated and interested in provide, you know, looking at this as a second career. There's development, there's leasing, brokerage, construction, property management, asset management. So there were so many things that I thought I could broaden their worlds to for what they could do after they were done with football. So um, we started a fund and it took a while you know, talking to financial advisors, talking to the players, because most of this is foreign, even to the financial advisors. Most of them don't really understand real estate investing. If they do, it's really house flipping, buying a house for an Airbnb project. And so it's it's very different from, you know, being on the commercial side. So there was a lot of uh, hurdles for me to educate. So I got a lot of notes. I want to unpack some of this, man. This is this is really good. And, and I think the biggest thing is I'm excited to bring you on because of the niche and because I have a lot of current athletes that I you know know and then a lot of former teammates and people that I've played against that are listening to this podcast. And so I think this is going to really create a another path and another option for for them that they don't even know it's available. Right. And so so let's dive into this. So first off when you really found that passion to start investing in net leasing. Let's just talk about like, were there specific tenants that you tried to follow and attract to? Did you build relationships with certain corporate offices? How did you create deal flow? Cause that's always the important piece first. How did you create deal flow? Right. Well, a lot of it in the beginning was listening to my clients, listening to the, to my clients that wanted to buy these assets. You know, some of it was geographical, right? A lot of our investors, the first places they'll look are going to be the tax-free states for obvious reasons, right? If you've got an asset that's bringing you cash flow, having it in a state that you know is an income-free state is is helpful. Mm-hmm. But the other part of that, just as building my own you know portfolio and my own ideals of what I think is a good investment is. You think about how people buy stock, right? Mm -hmm. They believe in the company. They believe in what the business model is or what the service is or or the technology that maybe it uses. So, you know, for instance, you know, take an Amazon. Amazon stock, if you bought it when it was really low compared to now, you did great, right? I have stock and I believe in diversification of your investments, but I have no idea why stock goes up and down. I have no understanding of what that business model looks like and how, why does that affect it? You know, if, if the CEO, you know, has a personal situation like a divorce, how does that affect my stock? You know, and what I, I guess what I found is that I'm much more conservative in my investment strategy because as much as I know that there's people that make a lot of money in the stock market, I'd much rather have a property that Amazon has a long term triple net lease in because it doesn't matter what happens to their business model. It doesn't matter if there's a competitor that comes into their space. They're required to pay out that lease. Mm -hmm. So I know exactly how much money I'm making for the next 25 to 40 years, depending on how long the lease is. And that to me felt, you know, felt secure. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm not telling people to run from the stock market in any stretch of the imagination, but what I am hoping, especially for these athletes is Figuring out where they can place their money into real estate. Why is that important? I mean, there's going to be a hundred new stocks over the next ten years that that come onto the market. They're not making any more land, and you know. So it, it, again, it's a beautiful thing when I'm watching your stories on Instagram and I see you buy a big parcel of land and you 
you know, turn it into this community where people can live and work and play. That's what it's all about to me is being able to, to leave something for the next generation and be able to drive by it and see it and say, I built that and I developed that. So I think part of it was, what do I believe in as companies? And then, you know, now because of the pandemic, a lot of clients are stepping back and saying, okay, would this be something that could be ill affected by a new pandemic, a different yeah you know, virus gyms, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help a couple NFL players now find some space to create their own training facility. And a lot of landlords are not interested in having gyms as a, you know, a tenant because of what happened with COVID and they all had to shut down and most of them stopped paying rent and had to leave. So, you know, I do look at which, you know, which tenants are, are going to be essential. What, you know, we all saw what happened to kind of Barnes and Noble where you can buy that on Amazon and that kind of went by the wayside. Um, You know, it's really, we've got Postmates and DoorDash and Uber Eats, but people still like to go out and eat, you know, so looking at where you fit in and, and where your risk level is important. So for me, it's, you know, where do I go? What do I participate in? What do I believe in as a company, but also you know, what is not going to be taken down by Amazon? You know, what yeah. can, can stay, you know, some of the experiential things can't, mm-hmm. you can't go on online and play top golf, you know? So <laughs> yeah, it can't happen. <laughs> well, cause remember there was this whole movement of e-commerce resistant, like, you know, triple net leasing. And then it's now essential, you know, or pandemic resistant, That's essential. Right. So let's talk. So I want to back up, right? Because you and I, we can talk so high level to where we leave some people behind just because it's just what we do. And um, I think we got a lot in common. We figured that out when we talked a couple of years ago when we first connected. And But I want to slow down for our listeners and make sure that they're tracking with us. So I want to go back to like on a commercial investment, mm-hmm. what does triple net leasing mean? Like, because you see it all oh, single net, double net. Can you just walk me through as a new investor in the commercial space. Cause see, you don't hear that lingo in the residential space or multifamily. So let's dive deeper into just the basics and the fundamentals of commercial leasing or commercial investing and leasing. Perfect. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that too, because I was thinking about that as I was talking. So triple net lease uh, assets are properties that have a long-term lease on them. And what you're thinking about as an investor is number one, you're thinking about location. And number two, you're thinking about your credit tenant. And then you're thinking about your your lease terms. Mm -hmm. So for a triple net lease, that means that your tenant, if it's an absolute triple net lease, your tenant, let's call it Starbucks, Mm -hmm. is going to be paying your rent. They're going to be paying your property taxes. They're going to be paying your insurance and they're going to be maintaining the property. And so it's really like they're treating it like they own the property, except you're the person on the deed, you're the person they're paying rent to, but they handle all of the costs associated with owning that piece of property. And there are varying levels of triple net lease. And sometimes you have to be very careful when you're looking at opportunities because sometimes they'll put the NNN sign on the offering memorandum or on the flyer and you assume that it's a triple net lease. But there's a lot of leases that are, they'll pay your taxes, they'll pay your insurance, and they'll pay your rent, but they carve out that you as the landlord and the owner of the property are responsible for roof and structure. And if it's a new building, that might be okay. There might be a 15-year Starbucks lease in there and you've got a brand new construction building, so you're probably going to have a 10 or 15-year roof warranty. But if it's an older building and you've got a Starbucks lease in there and Starbucks is saying you're responsible for the roof and structure, well, if you're in Florida for hurricanes or Texas, maybe for tornadoes or things like that, you have to take some of the money that you make off of that property and put it in a reserve account because at some point you're going to need to replace that roof. Mm -hmm. So reading your lease is really important because that's what determines if it's a true triple net lease or a triple net lease or double net. And double net might be where it's missing one of those two things. A double net might be that they pay rent and they pay property taxes but they require that you get the insurance and maintain it or vice versa. They don't participate in the property taxes, but they'll hold their own insurance. 
So there's, there's so many different levels. There's leases where you pay for it and they reimburse you later, which are called pass-throughs. So it really just is, is for me as an underwriter, when I'm underwriting for a client is what is this client looking to get out of this property? Do they need to be completely hands-off? No management at all. Don't want to check in on anything. It has to be an absolute true triple net where that's where you hear that term mailbox money. Mm-hmm. You're just getting a check every month and everything's taken care of until that tenant leaves. So that's really the true definition of mailbox money. You just kind of wake up and there's money in your, your mailbox every month and you don't have to worry about your tenant. You're not worried about you know getting a call for a hot water heater or a toilet or anything like that. They are covering it just like they were an owner. And, um, and then there are that. some other people that are okay with, I really want this location. It's right next to Texas A&M. And I think it's a great location. So I really want this. And it's a, it's a Chipotle, but I'm responsible for the roof and structure. Okay. I'm okay with that because of where it's going to be located. I know I'll always have interest from when, when Chipotle leaves, they're going to have another tenant wants to move in here because of where it's located. No, that's good. Yeah. Cause people call that the true, true passive mailbox money. I've heard absolute triple net. That's correct. So you'll hear absolute. So if you guys are listening, if you hear absolute triple net, and usually those cap rates are compressed, but that's what sh- that's what Till is talking about. So let's talk about pass throughs versus cams. Like walk me through if I'm OK. So now you've educated me on triple net, single net, double net. You've absolutely you, you've educated me on absolute triple net. Talk through cams and pass throughs real quick. Just a flyover. OK, so cams are an acronym for common area maintenance. And this is usually when you have more than one tenant. So if you have a building that has a an Aspen Dental and a Chipotle. They're right next to each other. They occupy the same building, but it's split into two. So you've got a multi-tenant situation there. So you have two different leases. Chipotle's mm-hmm. lease is going to look far different than Aspen Dental's lease. Aspen Dental is going to have a different time, maybe even a different rent rate. Mm-hmm. And what you're going to do with common area maintenance is, hey, there are going to be some expenses that me as the owner are taking on by owning this building. And it could be parking lot. It could be lighting in the parking lot. It could be landscaping. It could be the HVACs, you know, the air conditioners on top of the building. And common area maintenance is basically you're saying this is the cost of maintaining this property. And I'm going to divide that up between my tenants. And it's usually by square footage. So Mm -hmm. if you've got a 10,000 square foot building and, you know, Chipotle's in 3,000 and Aspen Dental's in seven, they're splitting it 30%, 70% as far as what you can put back on them to reimburse you for. Or you assess them that amount and they pay that in rent and you take that and then go and, and you know pay your landscaper and pay your asphalt striper, et cetera. So common area maintenance, which is called CAMS, is really what does it cost you to, to own this property maintenance-wise? And it does not include usually taxes and insurance. Those are other things that you can then take that and do the same thing. You divide it up by how much square footage they have. Pass-throughs are basically you saying, hey, the total cost of taxes, insurance, and common area maintenance for this building is X. And you're in half the building and you're in half the building. So you're going to pay half of X and you're going to pay half of X. So that comes through to me, it's passed through. And then, you know, you as the landlord still have to go and pay it. Whereas if you had a true triple net lease, they're paying it and all you get is the net rent. Yep. And there's no work on your end. You don't have to pay anyone or schedule any maintenance. Um, it's all taken care of by your tenants. So those are the differences. Man, great job. I couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> <laughs> Even the tenants that you're quoting are tenants that I have. So you said Starbucks, Aspen Dental. So it, it's just, that's that's awesome. Sports clips, they're all, you know, and again, there's differences in your tenancy, even based off of, are they a corporate guarantee or are they yep. a franchisee owner? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with our fund for the guys, I'm really focused on being conservative because they do have such a small amount of time to be big income earners. So mm-hmm. we tend to not take much risk at all. And mm-hmm. so I won't look at owning a property that has, let's say, a Popeye's chicken in it unless that operator, if it's a franchisee, that operator has to have more than 300 units and has to be in operation for 10 years so that I have a sense of this operator knows what they're doing. 
and they're willing to put their other 300 units as the guarantee for this one, right? But if you've got an operator that has three of them, to me, that's not worth the risk because- They're, they're, they don't have the the financial breadth to really cover this type of thing. So then I would be, you know, advising any of the guys looking for properties like this isn't a corporate guarantee. So you're taking a risk there, which means you're going to get a little more return. You know, you're going to get a, a higher cap rate, but it also means that's because you're assuming a little more risk. Yep. And so we, so my wife and I, we rank our, when we're looking at these projects and we look at the tenant, you know, when you're trying to underwrite it. We like corporate back, triple A rated type companies, right? So the Starbucks, whatever. And then, so we have it in three levels. So we have corporate and then we have franchise owner, but like the one that we have is AT&T. He's got 1800 locations. Just like corporate for me. Exactly. And so, and then that third level is more of the local owner, less than 50 locations. And that's where it gets tight. Right. You have to underwrite, just like you said, you kind of put them in buckets and you say, hey, if I'm going to have this property, I I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't suggest having a single tenant property where you've got that third bucket of somebody that's got less than 50 units, unless you really believe in that tenancy or you've seen their financials and you can gauge, hey, they can handle a 10 year lease plus some Mm -hmm. options. Yeah. But if you've got a mixture, it's kind of nice to have that mix because, again, you want to think of as an owner, you're starting to think of real estate concepts. Hey, I've got this strip center and this tenant brings these types of clients in. And so this is a complimentary type client, even though it's not a corporate AAA rated you know, tenancy, but they go together. You know, just like when I'm developing something, if I know what I'm developing for, like let's say it's a Bass Pro Shop. I know what tenants I'm going to seek out for the out parcels to put near it mm-hmm. because they have the same demographics. They're going after the same, you know, customer. So you're going to get like a steakhouse. You're going to get, you know, some kind of entertainment venue. You're going to get a, a, a mid-level hotel. So, you know, you kind of start to see, and even as you're driving, you can start to see when you're in a certain neighborhood, you're like, oh, that's right. That tenant makes sense here. Um, so that's a good piece of property to own because that tenant, that's exactly where they need to be. You know, you're not going to put a Whole Foods in a market that can't support it, where, you know, the income level is low or the amount of people in a mile, three mile and five mile radius is too low. So, you know, you start thinking on these bigger levels when you're doing commercial investment because you're starting to think like location. You're starting to even start thinking about egress and ingress. How easy is it for people to get to my property? I mean, we all know that, you know, especially for me, there's a Chipotle that's really close to me, but I have to make a U-turn at a really, you know, congested corner that I might miss the light a lot of times. So Mm -hmm. I'll go further to go to the one that actually has a pickup window and Mm -hmm. it's super convenient. So, you know, you start thinking about those types of things when you're looking at buying or even developing. You're like, do I want that Chipotle? I mean, it's still the same credit as the other one, but the other one is more convenient. So as a consumer, I'm, they probably do better numbers just because of that. No, that's good. Man, this is, this is going to be a great episode. So when we, when we say credit, so what does that mean? When, if I'm a single family investor who's been flipping houses, wholesaling, Let's say I've done a couple of duplexes and I'm trying to kind of graduate. You know, it's kind of like Monopoly, right? You start off with the greenhouses and then you get the hotel, whatever. If I'm trying to graduate to the commercial space, what does credit mean? Because we talk location, credit, lease terms. What does credit mean to you? Like when you when you throw that out there. So first and foremost, when we're talking about a credit tenant, we're talking about investment grade, which is kind of like, you know, what you and your wife did. You you start putting your own grades on it, but there's Moody's, there's Standard and Poor's, which is S&P, there's Fitch. There's, there are companies that will rate those yep. publicly traded companies because publicly traded means you get access to their financials. They can't hide anything. Oh, nope. And so you get to look at their financials. They're posted on their website. You can log into their quarterly calls and hear what they're talking about, hear how they're handling the pandemic and get a sense for yourself. But these credit uh, rating agencies will give them A, double A, triple A, triple B, B minus, you know, you go all the way down. And all that means is it's kind of like when you're in high school, right? If you're getting A's, you're doing great. If you're getting B's, you're okay. You're, you're, you're still doing okay, but not, if you're getting C's, it's like, eh. and that's Mm -hmm. kind of what you need to think about with investing. 
We yeah. won't look at anything that's less than investment grade. So it has to be BBB or above. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you, you have an opportunity as an investor to do your homework, like to log into, you know, if they're publicly traded, see what they're, what they're doing. And not all publicly traded companies are created equal. Right. And that's where, you know, having somebody that understands the landscape can help you muddle through that. Cause you might think, well, you know, Aspen Dental is a national company and so is Chipotle, two entirely different financial P&Ls, right? You have to look at how much loans, how many loans are these companies taking out? How leveraged are they? How much cash do they have on hand? I mean, sometimes the most surprising tenants have some of the best, you know, financials. Sherwin Williams is a great company. And you just never think of them as one of those, you know, it's not a real sexy company necessarily to own a, you know, a piece of property that has a Sherwin Williams paint company in it, but (laughs) they're never going to not pay your rent. So being able to look at those, and there's even a few that, you know, aren't going to be public. So you're not going to have access to their unit level stores, sales. You're not going to know exactly how much cash on hand they have, but you have an idea based off of your own experience with it. And you can look at things like cap rates in the market to judge how well they're doing. Chick-fil-A is a great example. Chick-fil-A is never going to give you their unit sales per, you know, for each store. They're not going to give you their financials audited or unaudited. But you know that Chick-fil-A is killing it because you've been in those lines a lot of times <laughs> after practices or on your way. <laughs> and, and so you can look at when, you're, when you go online and see what properties are available. You can go online and see, oh, wow, these are all trading in the you know, three and a half to five and a half range. So that's the cap rate. That's your return. It's not much, right? You can get some of those returns. You can get on bonds and some other things. So it means that they're, you're not taking much risk, which means they're doing very well as a company. That's really good. So as we as we progress, so a lot of times I try to explain cap rates to people. Let's talk what a cap rate is and the difference between a cap rate and a return, because obviously you and I know it's, the, it's, the, it's about if you leverage it or not, because if you pay cash, that's your return. If you leverage it, blah, blah, blah. But if you could break that down for me, and then let's talk about what the current market cap rates you feel are good. So like as you're, as you're looking to underwrite a deal, once you kind of get through the location, the credit, the lease terms, what kind of cap rate makes sense? So let's talk cap rate and then we'll go to that question next. Okay, great. Yeah. So cap rate, here's how we like to explain it. And I just had all of the NFL investors come into Tampa for a two-day class from the CCIM Institute. And they do a great job of kind of really breaking down what cap rate is. But cap rate for all of your listeners is a one-year snapshot of what is this property return on my money? If I bought it today for cash and I got one year's rent from the tenant, what is that return? So what is that one year snapshot? So to give you an example, if you buy a piece of property for $100 and you're getting $10 a month in rent, um, or let's say it's, let's say it's, uh, yeah, let's say it's $1. Let's do that. That'll make it easier. So you buy a property for $100 and you get $1 a month in rent. At the end of the year, you have $12, right? So you divide that $12 by your purchase price of $100 and you get a 12% return. So you know that you bought that property for $100 and every year you're getting 12% back because you're getting $12 back. So that's a one year snapshot of a cap, cap rate. It gets a little bit more complicated um, when you talk about return because return is how much do I make over the life of owning this this property, not just that one year. Because here's what happens on most leases. After five years of owning that $100 property, that rate uh, rental rate goes up to one and a half dollars a month. So now all of a sudden I'm getting $18 per year. So now I'm getting an 18% return on my money. So now the first year was 12%, the next year is 18% or at 5 years whatever you have rent increases at, your your cap rate changes, right? So now your your return is going up. So you have to average that. So that your return is at the end of owning that property, what did you get out of it versus what you put in it? So it's over the lifetime and so cap rates are really interesting because it, you know, I tend to say that 
commercial properties are not quite as influenced with the economy as maybe sometimes residential more or less has, you know, they, they follow the inflation more. Whereas, you know, even when things get tough in maybe the residential market, there are still these high net worth individuals who are doing a lot of trades on the commercial stuff because a lot of times that affects the stock market. And so they stop playing in the stock market and pull out and start investing in real estate that has had a little bit of a depression, but not, maybe not quite as much as maybe the stock market. Yeah. So when you're looking at a cap rate, you're looking at what is the appetite for this property from investors all over the world. Yep. And I've sold properties to people who've never set foot in the United States from Brazil and China, but they know what Burger King is. They know what Miami is, and they know that that's a great purchase. So you've got foreign investors too. So for example, if you bought a million dollar Starbucks that is paying you $50,000 a year in rent, you're getting a 5% return on your money, right? You're getting $50,000 each year for that $1 million investment. So what can you do to make that better? Well, you don't pay the million dollars cash to buy that Starbucks, right? Lever You're leverage. going to put 50% down and put $500,000 into that property and get a loan for the other 500. Now you're not going to cash flow 50,000 anymore, but you might cash flow 35. Mm -hmm. And now if you divide 35, thousand by your five hundred thousand dollar investment now your your return just went up your cap rate just went up yep. so using leverage is really important and that's one of the things that I really am trying to focus our educational piece with the guys is learning how to use leverage you mean how, learning how to use loans and they're out there the interesting yep. thing too about um, commercial is many times you can get your loan based off of your tenant's credit, not yeah. yours. So when I go to the bank to buy a property, as long as I have my down payment, they're looking at, well, who's my tenant? Who's paying Teal rent? And and because that's how she's going to pay our mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a 15-year Walgreens, they're going to say, hey, we're going to give you 70% uh, loan to value, and we're going to make sure that it's paid off in 10 years, or you've got to refinance within 10 years. So they'll even extend it out for as long as the lease is. Yep. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to utilize leverage that will increase your buying power and your return, especially now the rates are still low. I know they're going to be creeping up here, but as long as you're buying a property whose cap rate is, is above what you're going to get on the treasury, then you still got that margin there. And again, what you've got is you've got cash flow over a certain amount of time, even if it's little, but you also have that appreciating value, just like you do under your properties, those beautiful houses that you build. Those people are buying those houses at a certain price per square foot, but they know that in a matter of years, that price per square foot for that property is going up. Same yeah. thing's happening on the commercial side. You've got that cash flow and you can, you're, you're buying a cash flow. It's like a bond wrapped up in a piece of real estate. And at the end of the day, you still have some upside because your real estate should be increasing if you did a good job picking your location. That's great. So loan to value, when you're looking to, to leverage and that's what we, you know, because obviously, you know, everybody listen, like you can pay cash for stuff. And if that's your strategy, I understand. I have clients that just say, hey, I'm doing a 1031 exchange. That means they sold something else. They want to move equity into something and they don't want to be bothered. They just want to buy an absolute triple net asset and just pay cash and get a return on their money. But if you want a better return and you want to try to grow where instead of buying one asset, you may be able to leverage and buy three and your returns higher because we, I've talked about this before. If you're sitting on cash, cash is trash. And so you got to leverage that cash because it's not backed by gold anymore in America. It's backed by debt. And so in order to in order to hedge debt, you have to get debt. So loan to value, what kind of structure are you putting together on these funds? Uh, are you going and saying, look, we're going to do, are you doing it as a syndication where it's more of a, a one-off transaction or are you raising a fund and then and investing it into multiple assets? Yeah. So I don't do any syndications in, in the sense that I want to make sure that everybody who invests is on the title. Mm -hmm. I want them to not just be putting money into a development or into a deal and getting some sort of return out. Everybody who invests is going into the owner. ownership on, yeah. onto the entity. 
They need to understand what comes with ownership, right? And that's just something they may not have had the experience with before. What comes with ownership? What responsibilities? You know, why is it important that I think about this? When do we sell? Why do we sell? So when we do a fund, what we do is we raise the money. And right now what we're doing is development. So we bought a piece of property. We've got a couple now, but we bought like 20 acres uh, near the Tampa airport. And you develop a property for a specific tenant. You kind of know what the tenant's going to pay in rent. You start negotiating that rent. And and then you've got all your numbers. You know how much money they're going to be paying you in rent. You know who that tenant is. And so you know what you're going to be able to turn around and sell that property for because you know what cap rates are going for right now. And so you can really kind of calculate out, you can do your pro forma on an Excel spreadsheet. It's really not that, that difficult. Um, and I, you know, I send it on to all of our investors and make them play around with it. Because if you just change that rental rate up a little bit, I mean, you know, with your properties, if you just increased everybody another 50 cents, the amount that it trickles down to with the cap rate and all that kind of stuff means a significant change in when you exit that property, how much profit you make. Yeah. So we look for, you know, building the funds. We figure out whatever our money amount is that we need. We buy the land and we will leverage, even sometimes we'll leverage the land. If we know that we're buying this property for a specific tenant, which I highly suggest if you're going to be doing development, you secure the property and then you give yourself a long period of due diligence so that you can do all your testing do your surveys, do your site plans. But in that time, you're also going out and making sure that you've got the tenants in place that want to be at this location. And then once you know what that is and the numbers make sense, then you close on the property. And then you can go to the banks and you can leverage the banks with those leases. And so you get loan to construction costs. It's not even loan to value anymore. It's loan to construction. And and some Some of the banks will loan 100%, depending on who your tenant is, what your lease is, and where your property is, what you paid for the property. You can get 100% of your construction loan paid for with a bank loan. So then you build it, you turn over the property to the tenants, and you market it and sell it. Then you take those profits, use that 1031 exchange vehicle that you mentioned, which is still still available right now. Don't know what Biden's going to do with all that. Um, but you take that and you put your, all of your money and your profits into that and you roll it into the next deal. And to your point, you take that, let's say if you build something for a million dollars and you come out with 2 million, instead of paying capital gains tax on that extra million dollar profit, you take those 2 million and now you go and buy two or three different properties. So now you have diversification and you can diversify in your geography by going into different markets in industry. You can have like a fast food here. You can have an an auto there, a Tesla there. You can have, you know, a a hotel here. So you can really diversify even within commercial real estate, not just geography, but also within what sectors, you know, you could have a medical office. And so that's really what I'm trying to, to teach these guys is that there is, like you said, the majority of the people that made their wealth here in America did it with land. And there are ways to get involved in it, even on the smaller level. You know, this fund was set up for those guys that didn't have enough money, maybe necessarily to buy their own Starbucks, but four or five of them could throw a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars in and they could go in together and buy this and share the cash flow and then turn around and sell it later or build one and sell it for profit and then move it into a cash flowing property and another development. So it's really just trying to give them all the different angles that they can use commercial real estate to make money where you don't have to to know a lot about it. I mean, I would highly discourage people, if you're not Terrence, to get into house flipping. It yeah. is, I just have so many stories, you know, they, they watch HGTV and flip this house and they're like, this is easy. I can do this. Yeah. I've got a great sense of style. There are just so many different factors that can derail that investment. And it and it's really, you know, it's really heartbreaking to have so many of the guys that are in the fund that have lost money on things that should be real simple flips in their minds, but they're not. Yeah. Yeah. And because you because flipping houses is very speculative. And I've told people that I've never flipped houses. Everything I've always told my wife and I, whatever investment we do, townhomes this long-term hold, long-term hold, long-term hold. And so we want to make sure that we develop something. And the same with our commercial stuff. 
we bought all our commercial stuff that we've been buying and that we're still buying. So because we want a long term hold, you know, and so that's why we like to, like I said earlier, and you broke it down in an amazing way to AAA rate it and the different ratings. We've been really chasing Chipotle. So let's talk about that. Who do you feel like right now in 2021 off the backside of the pandemic is in your mind, kind of your like top five, top 10 tenants that you're tracking? Okay. Well, obviously e-commerce um, has still gained quite a bit of traction. So a lot of the stuff that we're developing has an industrial component to it. So there will be an industrial asset on the property and whether that's for Amazon or FedEx or UPS or, or even a, a cold storage, you know, like Chick-fil-A, they have uh, a need for putting food into large storage places that then can be you know, transported out. So having an idea of logistics, even for a company like Chick-fil-A, they have an industrial need as well or you know, some of the other companies like Walgreens and even Walmart and Target, they have these, you know, industrial distribution centers and things like that. So right now I have a, quite a bit of focus on industrial because there's a, there's a trend right now and there's this high demand and it's very quick to build and the price per square foot. And I was, you know, talking to someone earlier about, you know, lumber is not, doesn't affect the commercial side quite as much as it might for residential. Mm -hmm. Just because of how a lot of these, especially the industrial buildings are built with tilt wall constructions and metal and masonry. Yep. Um, and so industrial, I kind of have, you know, in my heart right now, because we're working on quite a few, I think we have a little over 2 million square feet in development right now of industrial. But as far as like your day-to-day -day stuff, I do like Chipotle very much. They have a good business model, but they also have pivoted very well with the pandemic. So all of their new stores have these pickup windows, um, mm -hmm. which I know you, you probably noticed there's been a lot more drive through, which sometimes in certain counties and ordinances, it's hard to get a drive through. If it's not already grandfathered in with the bank being there, that's maybe gone. It's hard to get a drive through. So those are going at a premium. You'll see smaller footprints like Taco Bell and Duncan have gone with, hey, not as many people want to sit in here and have their tacos and their donuts and coffee. But if we can create drive throughs on both sides of a much smaller building, that makes sense for us. And they've increased their sales. Mm -hmm. So I like Chipotle. I always like Chick-fil-A, even though you'll even find that a lot of Chick-fil-A's are out parcels to like a Lowe's or a Home Depot or a Super Target. A lot of those larger tenants don't enjoy having them near their property because it does create some traffic uh, problems with all of the uh, drive throughs getting backed up. And it's usually right where you're turning in to go to Lowe's or somewhere like that. I do like, you know, your coffee concepts are always going to be strong. Um, regardless of, you know, everyone working from home, there's still great sales in Dunkin' and uh, Starbucks. You know, and there's there's really some good up and coming ones as you see the trends change, like a Tesla, where they're going to have these charging centers, but they'll also do maintenance and repairs and things like that. So as Tesla and electronic uh, and electric cars become more prevalent, you're going to see more of those instead of the gas stations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, gas stations do well. Wawa's do they crush it? So, and that's just a, it's like a circle K or a racetrack. Um, it hasn't quite gone across the whole country yet, but it's, it's on its way. That's awesome. So yeah, those are a couple that, you know, I really like, and I understand the financials of, and, and, you know, usually their real estate, you know, management team does a really good job. So if you have some, if you have a Chipotle saying, yes, we want to be on that corner, that's a great location. Yes. We'd like to have you develop for us there you know that it's good real estate. For sure. And building those relationships with those development teams are key too. Because a lot of times, like the way that we handle some of our corporate tenants versus some of the, probably the other landlords they had, they're like, hey guys, let us know where you're going next. Like they want to do business with people that they want to do business with, right? So I think that's important. Last couple of questions. I didn't realize that 45, 50 minutes flew by. What do you see opportunity in the next 12 to 24 months? Is it industrial? Is that kind of where you, and really you've probably already hit that, but. Yeah. Some tenants that you really believe in and, and like figuring out where, where should they be next? Where is there a, a void in the market or a gap? And then going and trying to find that. 
or if you have the opportunity to own a piece of property that it's the first in that community, like the first Chipotle or the first Starbucks or something like that. That's important too, because they, they've already done their homework. So you know that they have figured out that their growth is coming here and their demographic is moving here. So if you can look for being the first of something, owning a piece of property that will have the first tenants in that neighborhood, you're, you're going to do well. So I got so many notes. It's crazy. <laughs> um, let's close with our final thought. So what would be your final thought for our listeners? Just to leave them with, what would you leave them with? You know, I think the biggest thing that, that I'm finding that gives me so much pleasure now is just educating everyone on commercial real estate. I think it's kind of been taboo. You know, maybe that's not the right word, but it's kind of something that has not been open to a lot of people. And so people are afraid of it. They don't understand it. They've never heard it in their, you know, in in their upbringing or at home. And so they don't understand it. So they kind of just stay away from it. And everyone pretty much, you know, at some point in their life, you know, either owns a home or strives to own a home and they, they've been in other people's homes. So it's a little bit more familiar to them. What I would want to leave with people is that there are great podcasts like this one too, books. There are resources like me that I freely want to give this information out to people that are interested because it, it's only going to create stronger communities. If, you know, like you and your wife buying stuff in your community and in outer line communities just builds that community stronger because you've got a great landlord that wants to keep, you know, good services in the community. And so that uh, allows developers to go out and develop more when they know that there are people like you or like the fund that's going to buy the property or build the property. So keeping that going. So I think I want to leave people with it's really not that scary or difficult. You just need to do your research and you know g- get enough knowledge to be dangerous. And that's that's not even as much as you think it is. So seek out people who are willing to give that that knowledge freely and you know start looking at ways that you can invest. You know, there are some crowdfunding that do some things where you maybe in a syndication so you're not on the land ownership, but that might be your first delve into it. You know, for us for the fund complete transparency. I show them the pro forma. I show them the leases, the yellow eyes. I have a monthly call. If if you can find a group that will share that information with you, it just kind of opens up a whole nother investment avenue for you. And it's something that I want all of my players to teach their kids. Yeah. I think if we can focus on the next generation, understanding the value of real estate, because I've even seen it with my own children who are in their 20s, it's not that big a deal to own a house. Like it's kind of cool to be in a loft down, you know, just find cheap rent, but I live, work and play in the, you know, in the downtown areas. I I want to instill the fact that real estate is still such a huge opportunity for most families to transfer wealth to the next generation. Mm-hmm. And, and if I can impart that and it, and it, you know, it, it maybe enthuses someone to look into commercial real estate, then I've done my job. Man, thank you, Till. And do you mind sharing that that pro forma with me? Sure. The, the, yeah. And the I'm, I'm coming down to, to to Tyler in June, so I'll I'll bring some stuff for you as well. Sweet, yeah. So June 11th and 12th, we have the Terrence Murphy camp, and man, we're just trying to get pretty much doing what Till just said, just trying to give back to the community, trying to inspire people. I could easily go home and just talk about football. I could easily go home and just talk about faith and. No, but I I want to talk about financial literacy, what credit means, what you know, budgeting means, what buying your first home because I think you start there. And then I'll be doing the last session on financial literacy, which is why should you track your net worth and why should you invest in income producing assets. But it's going to be an amazing deal and um yeah, look for you're going to you're going to make it. Oh, that's awesome, man. I'm excited. Sam, I'm volunteering and however you need me and I'm bringing my son so he can participate in the football. So we'll be there. Oh, it's going to be fun. Well, thank you for coming on the show. It's going to be a great episode and I'll see you in a couple of weeks in person. Perfect. Thanks for having me, Terrence. I appreciate it. Great job. Thank you. 
Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of The Real Estate Entrepreneur with Terrence Murphy. Please subscribe on whichever platform you are listening and consider leaving a five-star review as that will help us gain traction and continue to bring you knowledge in the real estate industry. For more content, head over to terrencemurphy.com.